from Microbe TV. This is Twin, This Week in Neuroscience, episode number 29, recorded on April 25th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the nervous system. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Jason Shepard. Hey, Vincent. Good to be back. How are things out there? Pretty good. Uh, my parents are actually visiting from New Zealand, so this was the first time I've been able to see them uh, in a couple of years because, you know, New Zealand basically had a lockdown for, mm. for most of the pandemic. Um, they're just reopening borders now. Cool. All right. Well, we'll let you go as soon as we can, so you can go back to that. <laughs> also joining us from New York, Tim Chung. Hello. Hi, everyone. Good to be back as well. And I would be doing what Jason is doing uh, next month. Really looking forward to that. You going to you New going, Zealand? To visit, visit I'm not going to New Zealand. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to the UK to visit my sister, and my parents are already there to, nice. uh, to play with the grandkids. So yeah, great. Oh, cool. And from Nashville, Tennessee, Vivian Morrison. Hi, guys. Good to see you. You're in Nashville, right? Yes, that's correct. Did you? I, was there a pause there when you were like, that, wait a minute? Because you're moving at some point. <laughs> yeah, I was we just, weren't sure if you I figured yet. you would tell me if you weren't in Nashville. So, yeah, we're not there yet. Um, we leave at the end of May. Uh, but yeah, month. I'll let you know when I'm. Yeah, yeah. And I guess it's getting nice and warm in Nashville, right? Yeah. Um, it's been beautiful the last couple mm. of days. Just gorgeous. Um, I'm sure it's going to be like 95, you know, real soon. <laughs> I hope so. In New Orleans, it's already <laughs> really hot and humid. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Get used to that, huh? Yeah. Yep. Yep. <laughs> We, uh, my house is, uh, at 6,500 feet and it snowed on Saturday. <laughs> ah, ah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. We were uh, just in t totally different poles. <laughs> did it, did any accumulate? Yeah, no, it was, it was cold enough that it probably about an inch or so. Huh. Um, but the mountains, um, so like the ski resorts, which were a little bit higher, they got about 30 inches Whoa. total. So it was. It was actually a, a bigger storm than than almost any time we've had in the winter. Is, is uh, skiing still oh, wow. open? This this weekend was the last weekend for most resorts. I think Snowbird mm. remains open for the next few weeks, and we'll see. But <laughs> yeah, cool. a bit of a bummer for them. All right, time to talk some neuroscience, and it is my understanding that it's Tim's turn. Uh, it's my understanding as well. Uh, Good. Um, but yeah, it's, well, today we're going to talk about something that I know very little about, uh, but I just kind of, came, I kind of came across it and it sounds cool. So I was like, okay, let's uh, check this out. Um, so we are, I'm going to, so let's dive right in. Uh, the paper that we're going to cover today, uh, the title is called Astrocytes close the mouse critical period for visual plasticity. Um, and the authors, so this is going to be first of many problems I'm going to have today. The authors are all French, so I'm going to have to pronounce French names. Uh, but there are two co-first <laughs> authors, uh, Jerome Ribot and Rachel Breton. And two, if I'm understand correctly, there are two last authors as well, uh, which is Glenn Dalarak and Natalie Ruash. Um, my apologies for all that pronunciation. That sounds um, pretty good, actually. Uh. Thank you. Um, yeah, maybe I should ask someone else to do that next time. Um, but <laughs> Or just keep to like uh, American or English uh, papers. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, Anyway, uh, so uh, yeah, the reason why I picked it is because I know very little uh, about critical period. Um, uh, and for sure, I did not know anything about uh, astrocytes being able to control uh, the critical period uh, because uh, as uh, Vivian already mentioned in Glia 101 a while ago, astrocytes are, are 
we kind of think of astrocytes as part of the glial cells, as you know, providing the background support for neurons, who are really the the star of the show. Um, but as it happens, uh, uh, these researchers showed us that astrocytes might actually be very important. So uh, let's talk first about a little bit of background on critical period. Um, so what a critical period is is this. Uh, hypothesis. This people, f this finding it describes this finding uh, that people found where uh, when an animal, usually it's an animal. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if plants have critical periods. Um, you know what? Sea elegants have critical period. Oh, but that's an animal. Um, if an animal uh, <laughs> is um, when an animal is very young, when a, a juvenile animal. It is when its nervous system is the most plastic, so it can learn the fastest uh, during this period. And changes in the environment has the biggest effect during this critical period. And that this critical period doesn't last a lifetime; it's only around kind of a fixed lifetime, quite a small window uh, when the animal is young, and then it closes. And then once you get to uh, I guess speak for all of us, get to our age, you can no longer <laughs> learn anything anymore. I would um, actually also just add that critical periods apply to stuff outside the nervous system as well. For example, there's a critical period for bone growth in terms of height. And um, for example, uh, with respect to that, estrogen levels will rise, um, I guess, I don't know if it's, it must be in both males and females, but when it rises and passes a, a certain threshold, it closes the growth plates uh, on the long bones that take that uh, account for most of your vertical height. So uh. critical periods, I think, um, are really just like developmental programs. Like, for example, there's a critical period for the development of each organ. You know, and after it has closed, you can't really have any other changes to the structure. Um and so, like I said, developmental programs that are kind of ingrained. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to say that it's kind of a more general phenomenon, not something that just exists in the central nervous system. Cool. I haven't, I haven't thought about that. Think, I haven't thought about growing as a critical window as well. But yeah, you're <laughs> absolutely right. I mean, I have oh, two children who I'm just watching right. get bigger. <laughs> so, you know, it's on my mind. Um, yeah, and, and I would say that... Um, you know, these critical windows are are actually quite important in humans because we have this very protracted development of the brain. A mm -hmm. lot of animals, there's there's a lot of innate behaviors that are encoded right away by the brain. And so they come out, you know, and they can walk and they can um, do a bunch of things that, that, uh, that require them to survive. But humans were helpless for so long because our brains take so long to develop. And so these critical windows of plasticity are, we're talking quite, quite long. And we all know that things like learning languages and being able to learn how social cues work, those are all very important um, experiences that we have as, as children. And there is this sort of window where if you don't get the right experience, you can really have long-term uh, delays in development and effects on the brain that, that um, we still have um, issues combating as a society. So, um, so for humans, I think these critical windows of plasticity of the brain development are super, super important for um, many key behaviors and setting up, you know, um, our lives. Mm. Um, what is, um, what I don't, actually, I'll, before, uh, I should probably give some examples of critical period. Uh, uh, so in addition to what Jason mentioned, uh, so like a language and social cues, um, I think one of the, I think one of the most famous example of a critical period is um, in, I think, ducklings and maybe also goslings, like birds, uh, when they first hatch, um, they would kind of uh, imprint uh, mm -hmm. visually who the parents are, and if you happen to walk by with like your shoe, and a, uh, a duck hatches, the duck would just think that the shoe is a parent and start following the shoe around. I think that's the that's the story. 
Um, mm-hmm. And I think that window is fixed. Like after a certain amount of time, if the duck has not seen any moving object uh, in its visual field, it would then no longer imprint on any anything anymore. Do we know um, what uh, equivalent things are in humans at all? No idea. I've heard. I, I don't know. I don't know anything about this, but I've heard that supposedly infants are born being able to recognize. I mean, if if the same happens to babies, then they will be recognizing the OBGYN doctor and the nurses. I well, think, I don't. I don't parents. think babies actually can see very well. I mean, uh, I don't know how I know that, <laughs> um, but I think um, because I don't know that much about the development of the visual system either. But I think um, there's some idea that they don't perceive color as well, and so high mm-hmm. contrast black and white is actually more. Um, relevant to them. And um, so I'm not really sure that they can distinguish much. I mean, if you yeah, look at I like... I think it does take a little bit of time for, for human vision to to develop fully. Um, there There is, I think, some data showing that that human children imprint on the, on the mother's voice mm-hmm. um, or the caretaker's, the caretaker's voice. And, and that's maybe the first uh, kind of imprinting that happens. It's not the same. I don't think it's to the same degree as like ducks or whatever, where it's sort of like, well, this is my mom and it could be anything. <laughs> and then it's fixed forever. Um, but, but it is true. I think that, that a part of the reason why it's easier to learn languages as a, as a re- really young kid is that you've imprinted on your care- caretaker's voice and whatever, language they're they're speaking you you pay more attention to it and and relatedly actually another interesting part of that in learning languages that there i think there's a critical period for being able to hear certain sounds and then create those sounds with your create the motor patterns involved in making those sounds for Mm -hmm. example like um very early on the sound v and b um they can differentiate between those, but then after a certain point, or maybe it's that they can't differentiate between them. I can't remember. Um, it might just then, be harder. Oh, I think, so for example, no, it's, in it's, Spanish, it's they don't true. have the V sound. They don't have the V sound. It's uh-huh. all B. They don't can't create very easily the V sound. Uh-huh. There's ex- plenty of examples of this, but that B, V interchangeability is one that's very, uh, very well known. Yeah, I mean, many... Uh, uh, um, accents that when people eventually learn a second language, the accents are there because they can't, in some cases there are some, some consonants and vowel sounds that they just can't hear because they never developed that ability early on. I want to hear you guys talk like Americans. (laughs) <laughs> and you, you don't want to hear me and Vincent pretend well, I mean, to be from either of the places. <laughs> my anecdote of this is that, um, we moved from South Africa to New Zealand when I was 14 and my brother was four years younger than I was, and he picked up the New Zealand accent straight away. Um, whereas I still don't have a real New Zealand accent, um, and neither did my parents. But then, you know, when I moved to the States, I, I, I had to also adapt to, to living here. So now my accent is completely screwed up. I could, I, <laughs> no matter where I go, I have an accent. <laughs> <laughs> but, You're just not part of the club anywhere. <laughs> That's, that's um, right. But then, but then it doesn't explain it. Yeah, I thought that too, because from my part of the world, people have uh, difficulties distinguishing between L and R because mm-hmm. in some of the languages, those are the sa- pronounced the same. But then it doesn't explain how come actors are so versatile and can do like a 1,500 different accents. Oh, maybe so their critical must be some, periods or their uh, plasticity, yeah, plasticity that, is that, that, different. Yeah, if you train enough. I, mean, that's a, I think that's actually an important point though. Um, I would say up until like 20, 30 years ago, uh, folks, scientists thought that these critical periods were really hard and concrete, that you can't really change anything after a certain period. But w- the more we found about, out about plasticity in the brain, we more re- realized that there is latent plasticity in the, in the adult brain. It's just a matter of trying to figure out how to you know, harness it and get access to it, whether that's through training through specific kinds of training or even through pharmacological, uh, means. But, um, you know, there's, there's this, there has been this long-term idea that, you know, adult brains can't learn, but that's not really true. Uh, we just have to figure out how to sort of tweak it a bit. 
Yeah, they're learning all the time, probably, but it's just not as um, apparent, <laughs> or it's done yeah. quite a bit implicitly. Well, I think it's this um, fascinating sort of problem that the brain has to deal with, which is that the world's constantly changing, and you want to be able to adapt to that w world, but you don't want to erase information in the brain um, regularly because then you know you're just not going to be able to. Um, remember anything so it's this plasticity versus stability issue and during the critical window there's a lot more plasticity and actually this is one reason why we think um you know people don't have great memories as a kid you, you can remember mm -hmm. some maybe really um salient uh, events in your life but you know you don't know you don't remember much about your your young childhood and that's partly i think because the brain is on this plasticity side and versus stability and then as you age uh, mm -hmm. it swaps and you become more stable and i think we always think about this stuff in terms of neurons and you know synapses and what's happening at the synapses so it's interesting in this paper that they're saying you know astrocytes are actually playing a key role in this and i feel like we're just at the beginning of understanding you know how they're uh all of the ways they contribute to this kind of thing Although I, I still think that most of what's happening here is through synapses, but it's that astrocytes right. are absolutely important for the development and maintenance of those synapses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's get into the paper. Oh, actually, no, even before that, I have to talk about uh, one of the, one more example that is critical for this paper of critical period. Of critical periods, yes. no pun intended. Uh, yeah, oh, <laughs> definitely, not, definitely not intended. Um, uh, so yeah, the the critical period. So we talked about language. We talked about uh, duck imprinting. Um, uh, we talked about social cues. Um, the critical period we're going to talk about today is in terms of vision. So uh, as it turns out, um, uh, your eyes, the way your eyes are connected to your brain. Um, uh, in your visual cortex, which is your brain, um, so your eyes, the way the eyes connect to the brain is the eyes go to the visual thalamus and then the visual thalamus then connects to your visual cortex where people think a lot of the kind of visual experience is processed. I don't know, I'm getting very hand wavy here. Mm -hmm. um, but in your, by and large, when people looked at the visual cortex and see how the cortex respond to stimulation to uh, one eye or the other eye, what they found is, by and large, your left side of the brain uh, respond to visual stimulus from your right eye. So it kind of goes contralateral. So your eyes, your, your right, your, the stimulus from one side of your body actually crosses the midline and then talks to the other side of the brain. It seems to be the uh, kind of like a, uh, motif that happens across a lot of sensory systems and also the motor system. Um, however, in your visual cortex, there's a tiny, a small, well, not tiny, there's a zone that actually does respond to both uh, your ipsilateral eye and, or your contra and also your contralateral eye. So both eyes uh, would actually talk to this part of the vis visual cortex. And this part of the visual cortex is called the binocular zone. And in human, it's really big because we have really good binocular vision. But in mice, and if you ever see a mouse, their eyes are on the side. Uh, so they only have a tiny bit of binocular vision. So this zone is uh, quite a bit smaller. And what people have found is that if you uh, were to, during this critical period uh, when the mouse is young, if you were to deprive vision uh, to one of its eye, so you can so people can do this uh, by you know putting think of it as putting an eye patch on one of the eye. Uh, then what you see is if you record from the visual cortex uh, from the opposite side of the brain, then when you deprive light for a long period from the contralateral eye, the response in this uh, visual part of the visual cortex to the contralateral uh, oh sorry. Forgot to mention, quite important. You deprive one eye, usually in this paper, it's the contralateral eye. You deprive it of light for, say, a few days. 
um, and then you remove the eye patch. And now you shine a light stimulus uh, in the contralateral eye, which had previously been deprived, versus the ipsilateral eye, which had not been deprived. Okay, so that's a setup. So now what you can do is you can basically record from the visual cortex um, uh, what is the response to the stimulation. So if you didn't have this uh, uh, monocular deprivation is the procedure where you patch the contralateral eye so that you don't see light on that eye. If you didn't do that, then usually in this binocular zone, it seems like the largest response is to, still to the contralateral eye, but there's also some response detectable to the ipsilateral eye. Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm learning all this through the paper, so I might make, be making mistakes. So yeah, feel free to chime incredibly in. incredibly complicated. I, I have never right. been able to keep it straight. I think, oh, you're, I think I mean, you're on the right track. So my lab does experiments on, on this. So, so, but I think the simpl simplest explanation is that you know, binocular vision, there's overlap of this, the reception of the fields that you see. So if you close one eye, you know, you have a certain part of the world, close the other eye, you have some, and the brain has to make sense when the, 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 the input from the both eyes is overlapping. And for us, actually, in humans, we have, you know, small, uh, a blind spot where both eyes, um, there's, there's not overlap, and your brain actually makes up that that because we don't look, you know, when you're looking around, it's not like you have a black hole in your um, vision. <laughs> anyway, that's an aside. But for um, and even in humans, but certainly for mice, um, you know, uh, you have a contra and ipsy side. And for mice, because they have less overlap of the visual field, the contra predominates. So, you know, one eye has more visual field than the other. And so in the end, um, that binocular zone is small, but there, but it is important for the mouse to be able to interpret the, the world. Um, and the history of this experiment goes back into the fifties by, um, two scientists, Hubel and Weasel, who end up actually getting the Nobel prize for this. And they did their original experiments in, in cats and monkeys, um, where they deprive the eye for for a few days, and just that one small manipulation ends up uh, enhancing vision in the open eye and reducing vision in the closed eye. And that that's recapitulated in mice, so you can do exactly the same experiment: close the eye and in, in, in the mouse, and it, uh, you can record those responses directly in the brain. Um, so it's kind of artificial, but one idea, you know, one way to sort of think about this is that in humans, for example, you can have visual defects like something called amblyopia um, that, that come from either having strabismus, so the eyes are not aligned. So, you know, some people have um, a misaligned eye that sees out that way. And if you don't correct that early on, and you and you then try and correct it as an adult, it's very difficult for the brain to make sense of that input. Um, so that's why these critical periods. So one, you know, if we understood how to sort of uh, prolong these critical periods or, or restore them in adult, you could correct these visual defects and then people could see normally. Um, in India, for example, there's a huge population of, of people who have had cataracts for, for their lives. And you now we have very easy surgery to, to get rid of those cataracts, but they still can't really see properly because the, the brain can't rewire itself. It seems to be a uh, evolutionarily disadvantageous situation, right? Or maybe it, it doesn't matter that you can't learn these things later in life because it hasn't been selected against? Yeah, I think it's that for humans, especially, right, we're living way longer than we usually would normally. So some of these evolutionary adapt adaptations don't make sense because now we've moved past that uh, that that uh, lifespan. But I think for the most part, this is, comes back to this idea that the brain really has to fix um, information because if you keep on rewriting that information, you're basically not going to be able to make sense of the world. Um, but the downside of that is that um, some of these um, plasticity mechanisms are not, you know, really evident. So um, in humans as well, I think the, the issue is that we have such complicated brains that if you were to have more plasticity that, uh, in an adult brain, 
um, that may cause more havoc I mean, more havoc than, than, than not because then you've just got rewiring happening all the time. Um, and because in simpler animals or less um, complicated brains, you can get regeneration of nerves and connections. And, you know, like some animals like worms, you chop off their head, they regrow the body and now they're all good. <laughs> yeah. I'll, um, yeah. Although it's, we'll go to the paper soon, I promise, but it's quite odd because <laughs> so obviously the, this, what we've been talking about this, um, if you deprive visual input to one eye, the, the, now your brain is less responsive to that eye. It turns out it only, uh, it predominantly happened when the mouse is young. And if you do the same experiment when the mouse is an adult, um, the the contralateral eye response is still high, actually. So um, it seems like it's a different kind of plasticity going on. It's, there's more plasticity when the mouse is young than when the mouse is old, and presumably same for human. Um but uh, as someone who actually needs to wear glasses uh, um, uh, without my, when I don't have my contact lenses in, sometimes I'll get a new pair of glasses and they will be a little bit misaligned. And for the first day, I'll see double vision. But right. after a day, I would then be able to integrate. And I also have heard of um, studies where people put on glasses that swap up from down and left from right, like completely mess up the vision. And they eventually do learn to adapt to it. So it's it might not, be um, it might not be a complete closure of the critical period, but it might be harder to relearn things. I don't know. I've, I'm just yeah, completely one, one, speculating. One way to think about it is that if you don't have the an, sort of uh, fundamental platform for, for in, um, encoding the visual information, you can't have re learning later on because that that platform is not there. It's like having you know a computer with a mis misaligned hard drive. And um, the motherboard is then fried. And so you come back and you connect a new hard drive and the motherboard's not working um, versus having a motherboard that works pretty well. And then you can still have plasticity later on. If you plug in a new hard drive, it just takes maybe a little longer to learn. Okay. So as in, um, I don't know whether it's real or not, but I think I've heard story where there, there are some. Uh, they've found people who, for one way or another reason, uh, have not learned any languages at all when they're young, and then it's very difficult for them to learn language as they're older. Whereas if you've learned some language when young, you can always learn a new language with exactly. a little bit, a yeah. little bit more ease. Yeah. In any case, let's go into this paper finally. Um, <laughs> so, so I just so we just mentioned uh, this critical period for vision, which is once again. Uh, you test it by patching one eye so that you don't see any light for a few days. And then you remove the patch and then you compare the response to the previously patched eye to the non-patched eye. And when the mouse is young, the response to the patched eye is much lower. Whereas if you do the same thing in the adult, the patching doesn't have much of an effect on you know, modulating the response. So the question that these researchers are wondering and I have absolutely no idea why they decided to look at uh, glial uh, astro astrocytes, um, but they were wondering if astrocytes might have some uh, something to do with this. But there, um, there was there was, um, there was one paper that had been published probably like a decade before, suggesting that astrocytes, the activity in astrocytes, uh, correlated with with the critical period. Um, and there's also been this idea with. It, other glia, so these microglia, where the microglia are involved in perhaps pruning synapses during that critical window, um, and that's how you sculpt the circuit. And so there's been this idea that you know these glia cells are important for modulating plasticity, um, but this is one of the first papers that shows that there's a cause that really there is a causal role for astrocytes in regulating the period. Ah, uh, okay, that makes sense. Um, so. So yeah, so these researchers um, decided to ask a question, if I have an adult mouse, but I give it immature astrocytes that are from uh, uh, young mice, that are the young mice that are still within the critical uh, period window, if I 
to get these astrocytes from young mice and inject it into the visual cortex of adult mouse, can I open this critical, peri uh, critical period again? So that's what they did. They, uh, they got astrocytes from uh, postnatal day one to three mice, so newborn mice, and they cultured it uh, in a cell culture for 10 days so that it proliferates, presumably. Um, and they injected it into the visual cortex, and then they measured... Oh, they injected it into the visual cortex, and then they... Uh, in, an, uh, in adult mice, and then they put these mice through the uh, monocular deprivation, this um, patching one eye so that they don't see light out of one eye. And as I showed, uh, and the control is they just inject the cell culture medium instead of the actual astrocyte. So going back to uh, Vivian's, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Vivian's I was going to say, that's twin. an interesting control that they use. Yeah, <laughs> it's definitely not exosomes. Um, so the medium would... <laughs> You would uh, contain all the stuff that the astrocytes release, maybe growth factor, uh, uh, maybe exosomes. Um, they found when they injected the medium, which is the control, um, in these adult mice, the patching did not really change the plasticity very much. Whereas if they, when they injected these immature astrocytes um, into these adult mice, then the patching deprivation did induce this signature of plasticity in these adult mice. And um, so based on this, this is the first, uh, first finding that, as, uh, as far as I can tell, that the astrocytes actually can reopen the critical period. Tim, um, did, so, they, did they take the astrocytes from the visual cortex or was it just whole brain? They apparently took it from the visual cortex. Okay. They they found they tried as hard as well. I don't know whether it's they tried. They gave it no, no, made an effort to all. go for the visual yeah, cortex. I, I, I would say cortex. I don't know if they really knew that it was visual cortex, but cortex. Uh, some sort of cortex. Okay, like yeah. and let alone the binocular zone of the visual cortex. I also so, yeah. think it's because these are very young animals. So the visual cortex uh -huh. is pretty undeveloped by, you know, P, P1, P3, it's super undeveloped. At that okay. point, you're just like, okay, it's cortex somewhere. Okay, okay. Um, I also think it's interesting that they cultured them for, what did you say, like 10 days? Yeah, 10 days. Like that's definitely enough time for, if like, um, for example, the protein that they end up looking at was dependent on some, you know, uh, environmental influence inside the visual cortex, 10 days would definitely be enough, I think, unless it was like epigenetic changes or something like that that were locked in. But it would be enough time for the phenotype to change. So it's interesting. Um, huh. So like, does that mean that astrocytes, when cultured in a di a young astrocytes culture in a dish, still no without the rest of the brain, still knows how old it is? I, I th Well, yeah, so when you put like... Um, oligodendrocytes or neurons in culture, you can kind of roughly count each day in vitro as being one day, like mm. as if they were still in the living organism. Uh, I mean, people say that. I'm not sure how many studies have actually been done to show that, but um, it probably, you know, it probably tracks pretty well. But um, okay. it's just... I would say they they probably remain fairly immature without the the cues that they should they would normally get from neurons. So it's the same. This is sort of this communication between glia and and, and neurons. So you kind of need the development of of um, the astrocytes to instruct synaptic synapses uh, on neurons, but vice versa. There's cues that are probably coming mm -hmm. from neurons that keep them. That, that say, look, I'm, we're now mature. You don't have to send us those goodies anymore. Yeah, that's true. I'll, I'll, come, back, I'll come back to Jason's point that has been paper published on this, so maybe we'll touch on this in a bit. But yeah, but even, um, but apparently, I was looking this up, um, the critical period for mice, for this visual uh, ocular dominance, so like uh, the plasticity of the visual input, um, the critical period is somewhere between uh, postnatal day, I think between 10 and 30, um, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's P20 to 35. Ah, okay. So because they harvested these astrocytes at P1 to P3, if you add 10 days, it is still within yeah. I mean, the mm -hmm. critical the period. The eyes in mice only open at P14. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, so the visual system is completely undeveloped until around P15. The eyes are open, and then within a day of the eye opening, there's a whole bunch of things that happen in, in the visual cortex. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so uh, so these researchers, based on these transplant of immature uh, astrocytes, have demonstrated that immature astrocytes can, in fact, reopen this critical period of plasticity. Um, so the next question would be, how do the astrocytes do it? So in order to uh, in order to uh, talk about the next bit of data, I'm going to have to make a pretty sharp turn and start talking <laughs> about this completely uh, novel thing to me called uh, the extracellular <gasps> matrix, the extracellular as, matrix as well as the perineuronal net. Oh, fabulous All right. topics. So, uh, so Vivian is obviously very pumped up about this, so feel free to chime in because I know very little <laughs> about this. Uh, well, um, I don't know that much about it either, but it's where I want to go with my research. Oh, so, okay. yeah, I'm, I'm very interested. Oh, so they're, cool. they're relatively understudied because the tools to manipulate them have not been great, but mm -hmm. the, the sort of gross manipulations that people have done definitely show that the ECM is super important for plasticity and stability of, of um, neuronal communication. Well, I'm so glad to hear you say that it's understudied because I'm like, yes, there's a niche for me. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, so the ECM Jason was talking about is the extracellular matrix. And that is basically, if you look at the, if you look inside the brain, you'll find neurons, you'll find cells, a lot of them, but the cells are, even between cells, there are spaces and that kind of keep these neurons in their place and not just float around like a, like, like a fluid. And these uh, extracellular spaces are composed of extracellular matrix. And these extracellular matrix uh, is a composition of a bunch of different uh, chemicals, including proteins and also these uh, carbohydrates um, that kind of make like... As the, as the name goes, like a matrix, like a scaffold for to hold cells together, to give it some structure. Um, and apparently there's been some speculation that the extracellular matrix can be critical for memory storage. So I remember um, when I was listening to Twin uh, previously that uh, Twin team talked about a uh, finding where microglia uh, was modulating extracellular matrix in the hippocampus during memory formation, and that can alter how well your memory is formed. And what is actually quite interesting, I uh, read about, I remember coming across some uh, story that in animals that hibernate, like squirrels, when they're hibernating, they actually lose like 50% of their synapses. Mm -hmm. So don't know why, they want to preserve some energy to stop keeping these proteins from in their place. So when they hibernate, go into hibernation, 50% of the synapses just go away. But when they come back from hibernation, those synapses come back. So one still unknown mystery is how do the synapses know to go back to the original places? And people have speculated the extracellular matrix leaves holes of where the synapses were previously. And wow. so the synapses know how to come back. But that I seems think really that, hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, I don't think uh, there's much progress on that front, um, whether that's true or not. Uh, but uh, for today's purpose, for this paper's purpose, um, one of the core component, well, not the core component, one of the component of this extracellular matrix is this um, structured called perineuronal net. And this uh, peri perineuronal net, um, which is, I'm completely new to this, uh, apparently is a kind of a net-like structure that can be found surrounding a particular type of neurons. Okay, so let's go first talk about what neuron it surrounds. It's been found to... Uh, kind of prefer, not exclusively, but prefer to surround these GABAergic interneurons um, in the cortex, but also elsewhere in the, in the brain. And these GABAergic interneurons uh, express this uh, uh, cell marker called pavalbumin. That's not important for today, uh, today's purpose. But these GABAergic interneurons, the purpose of GABA in the brain is to inhibit cells that it's talking to. And this... Uh, perineuronal net is a structure that people have found to seem to start to develop at a time when the, crit when the critical period is kind of closing. So when it's formed, the, the time, the kind of the time 
trajectory of when it's formed seems to correspond very well with the critical period. Um, and the, this perineuronal, perineuronal net um, is made of this uh, substance called chondroitin sulfate proteoglycan, in case anyone out there knows about this and is interested about this. Um, but it is a, it is actually this chondroitin sulfate proteoglycan is basically um, a, a molecule that is made of protein and then decorated, surrounded, kind of like a hairbrush by, mm -hmm. uh, uh, by these carbohydrate, sulfate carbohydrate molecules. Um, so kind of sugar. So it's basically protein with a bunch of sugar sticking out of, on top, uh, outside of it. And this uh, molecule has been found uh, enriched, not just in the perineuronal net, but also in the extracellular matrix, but also it's found in cartilage. Um, so basically it seems to be, uh, have a function of filling in spaces. Um, but in the perineuronal net, it seems to uh, also be important for holding in whether um, incoming uh, presynaptic terminals are located. So apparently people have kind of looked at uh, microscopy of um, these nets surrounding these GABAergic interneurons, and they found the presynaptic terminal to come through where the, <coughs> exactly where the holes are. So the input to these GABAergic interneurons would come through these holes in the nets and talk to the GABAergic interneurons to tell it to fire more or fire less. And the idea is that these nets might be important in holding not just the presynaptic terminals, but also maybe some of the presynaptic receptors. Um, but I would say, what is you know, to, to Vivian's uh, future directions in our research, we know nothing mm -hmm. about how ECM is instructing um, the circuit or the neurons to develop or what their actual role is in synaptic transmission. I mean, there's been very little. And so this controlled and sulfate, if you get rid of it, you destroy the whole per perineuronal net. So it's a very gross manipulation. And it's basically saying, okay, well, if you take out all the things that are holding the neurons together, now we, we see a defect. So it's like, well, okay, not too surprising. Um, and so I think the future for this kind of investigation is being able to sort of tweak things so that you're, you know, getting some information about um, the role of the ECM and in, in controlling the, the neuronal, like, you know, neur neuronal activity. So this paper sort of gets at some of that because they're sort of trying to get at molecules that may be important for the signaling and how, is, you know, how that, how the astrocytes are controlling the signaling. Mm. Um, second to second Jason's point, there's been previous paper. The reason why uh, we're we'll be so we're pretty heavily focused on this uh, perineuronal net, and one of the reason why the researchers are going to focus on it is because there's been previous papers where they found there's a, there's actually a, a chemical you can inject that dissolves these nets actually, and if you were to do it in adult mice, uh, people have found. You can first of all dissolve these perineuronal net around these GABAergic interneurons. Secondly, you can reopen the critical period for the visual plasticity. So that's why people think that these perineuronal net might uh, be involved in controlling the plasticity um, uh, of visual cortex and maybe in terms of GABAergic interneuron kind of maturation. Um, so, uh, Given that these perineuronal nets are very important, the researchers, back to this paper, the researchers are wondering, well, does, is there anything from the astrocytes that would tell us a little bit about the, how the perineuronal, oh my God, I'm going to have difficulties pronouncing PNN. this name. The perineuronal, PNN. <laughs> the PNN, the perineuronal nets formation. So there's, so they, there's a way of specifically labeling for these perineuronal net, the PNNs. Um, so they did that and they found it to be in a particular, enriched in a particular layer of the cortex. And what they also found is that astrocytes make these um, uh, proteins called connexin 30. And these proteins are essentially gap junction channels. So they allow astrocytes to talk to each other uh, uh, through basically tiny holes in the cell membrane that are, that are lined with these pro connexin proteins. And these this connexin 30 protein are especially 
strong exactly in the region of the cortex where you find these perineuronal nets, these PNNs. Uh, not only that, when they uh, did time point, then when they looked at the expression of this connexin 30 as the mouse is maturing, what they found is when the mouse is very young, when the critical period is still open, uh, there's very little of this connexin 30, but as the mouse matures, as the mouse grows older, the connexin 30 starts to increase. So this might very well they this might very well be a marker of the astrocytes maturing, and therefore somehow the astrocyte being mature might shut this critical window down. So the experiment the experimenters did another ex, uh, another experiment where um, so this is another weird thing. Apparently, it's also been no. Oh, actually, Jason, I don't know whether you can speak to this. It's been found that if you uh, in mice, at least, if you keep the both eyes of an adult, you have a nut, if you have an adult mouse that does not no longer has this critical period because it's been closed, if you then keep both eyes in darkness for four days, this reopens the critical window, a uh, critical period. Um, so, which is odd because you think, what happens if you do this in, in a, an adult human that you know? has had cataract surgery and can't see it with good acuity. Um, but in this particular, in the study that we're looking at, the researchers are wondering, well, we've previously, sh people know that if you keep an adult mouse in the dark for several days, both eyes in the dark, you can reopen this critical uh, period. Then if this connexin 30 really is closing the critical period, then by keeping the mouse in the dark, maybe we can inhibit this connexin 30 and thereby reopening this critical period. And that's exactly what they showed. So they, what, what they found, so they kept the mouse in the dark for four days and then looked at the connexin 30 expression and really did go back down. Um, so the, this allowed the researchers to conclude that connexin, the connexin 30 um, expression from these astrocytes seemed to kind of uh, geographically in the brain correlate to where the PNNs are, where the perineuronal nets are. And also the time, the timed evolution of connection, connection 30 expression, when it expresses in the mouse's life, also cor corresponds to the critical window, critical period. Um, so the researchers... Uh, <laughs> So connexin 30 is obviously important. So the researchers next wanted to find, to ask a question, um, do you need connexin 30 to close this critical period? What if you selectively knock down connexin 30 in astrocytes? Do these mice then have difficulties closing the critical period when they grow up? So they generated mouse that don't have connexin 30 in the astrocytes, grew them up, and then did these uh, monocular deprivation again. And what, they, what the researchers found was that in uh, wild-type mice that do still have connexin 30, um, this critical period basically shut by about, well, they only did, uh, post, by postnatal day 28, there's still a critical uh, window is still open. But by... 50 days, uh, postnatal day 50, so 50 days after birth, so young adult, um, this critical period has closed. Whereas in connexin 30 knockout mice that are only knocked out in the, knocked down, only knocked down in the astrocytes, this uh, critical period was still open by uh, P30, P50, postnatal day 50. Um, what's interesting is by postnatal day 100, even in the connexin 30 mice, this critical window seems to be closing. So it suggests maybe something else is also important. Um, but at least uh, this experiment suggests that the, they can delay the critical period closing by knocking down connexin 30 from the astrocytes. So it really pinpoints connexin 30 uh, playing a role in uh, closing the critical, win uh, critical period. So if... so the the researchers next asked the logical question, which is, if we have an adult mouse that has connexin, that lacks connexin 30 in the astrocytes, then these astrocytes might very well be in the immature state, you can think of, 
even when the mouse has, the rest of the mouse has become an adult. If that's true, if we harvest, uh, if we get astrocytes from adult mouse brain that don't have connexin 30, these adult astrocytes could still reop- should still be able to reopen the critical period in a- another adult mouse that do still have connexin 30. Oh, it's a little bit difficult to explain. Um, I hope I hope you guys understood that. But basically, they did. They have a normal mouse that whose critical period is already closed, and they've got an adult mouse astrocytes that do not have connexin 30. And if the lack of connexin 30 is what is important is in keeping the window open, then these adult astrocytes should be able to reopen the window. And that's exactly what they found. So it suggests that uh, even mature astrocytes can reopen the critical period as long as they do not have uh, connexin 30. Um, so, so, yeah, so this really establishes a link between astrocytes connexin 30 and the, the plasticity in the visual system. But we still don't quite have a kind of like a neuromechanistic link between what these what the connexin 30 might be doing. So the next bit of the experiment, the, um, the researchers turned it to slice electrophysiology. So, uh, so going back to the background, uh, just to remind our, our uh, so, listeners. So Tim, just, oh. just, uh, just to say we're running out of time, so um, you may want to condense this a little bit. <laughs> ah, okay. Oh, sorry. We are, it is two. Okay. So, so the next experiments, so previously we mentioned that um, the pavalbumin interneurons, the GABAergic pavalbumin interneurons, is what these perineuronal nets are surrounding. And we think these perineuronal nets are important for the maturation of the, these GABA interneurons, which is itself important for the critical period. What these researchers found was that the, um, in mice without connexin 30, the GABAergic input um, into the visual cortex neurons is actually reduced, which is consistent with um, uh, the inability for GABAergic interneurons to mature um, when you lack connexin 30 in these astrocytes. And the, um, the, the, theory, the hypothesis is that the reason why connexin 30 is important for the GABAergic interneurons to mature is because connexin 30 is important for the mouse to make these perineuronal nets that surrounds these GABAergic interneurons. So that's what these researchers, so the researcher uh, looked at this next, and that's what they found, is that when you don't have connexin 30 in astrocytes, these perineuronal nets don't really form around the GABAergic interneurons. So that probably explains why there's a reduced, um, there's reduced GABAergic input um, to the visual cortex neurons as a whole. Um, and finally, the researchers wondered, well, how exactly does the lack of connexin 30 from the astrocyte, how does that control um, the perineuronal nets formation? So what they did was they basically uh, used um, magnetic beads to fish out the connexin 30 from the astrocytes. So they got uh, mice that do express connexin 30 and also mice that do not express the connexin 30. And they use, uh, oh, my bad. They use uh, magnetic, magnetic beads to fish out the perineuronal nets and they did proteomics on uh, what was uh, associated with the perineuronal nets um, with, a fishing, with a fishing experiment. And what they found was that um, the one protein that seems to be involved is um, this uh, kinase that... Ooh. So they've actually identified a molecule. I, I say the, it doesn't the, matter, I guess. It doesn't matter too much, but the path... Yeah, they, they identified a molecular pathway... That converged on this one protein, right? This uh, MMP9, right. which is basically a protease that's extracellular um, and has been implicated in plasticity before. So uh, they're sort of converging on this pathway that could sort of modulate the ECM 
um, you know, which is interesting. I thought it was pretty interesting, but the, the connection between the, the, the actual re- sort of connection between this, uh, connects and, and, and the part, singling pathway wasn't clear. It's like, well, how does that, you know, actually work? And so that's where I think future directions can come in. Mm, yeah. So um, the, 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 the activation degrades the extracellular network and that gets rid of the, the window basically somehow. Yeah. Right, so right. MMP9 is a protease. So it, it basically, it's an enzyme that can degrade ECM. Yeah. And they found if they were when they inhibited this, um, when they inhibited the degradation of the uh, perineuronal nets by inhibiting this uh, MMP9 indirectly, they can uh, rescue this. Uh, they can rep, They can bring back the critical window so in connection not down. Basically, if I want to learn French, I just take a protease inhibitor. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> It's a really bad idea. <laughs> well, learning um, French, what's wrong with that? <laughs> It'd be helpful can, in reading authors' names. Exactly, I can pronounce <laughs> all the names. Um, but that's it. Uh, I'm sorry to run off time at the end, but the molecular mechanism is quite cool. That I'm, I'm just amazed can, that it's it's down to this only, right? But it, yeah, it, and in fact, I try to... Dec- so everything... So this paper, really, the contribution of this paper is to establish a link between astrocytes and the formation of the perineuronal nets around these GABAergic interneurons via this connexin 30. Um, but then what comes after the, like, how does the GABAergic interneuron <laughs> control plasticity um, and therefore the, the critical period? As far as I can tell, it's still completely unknown. Um, so like, how come the perineuronal nets itself is important? And why is the GABAergic interneuron, this one single type of, there are a dozen different kinds of interneurons in the cortex, why this particular type of interneurons is important? Um, it's also so unknown. I, I have an idea, which is what we're trying to test now, in that um, all of this inhibitory tone, so basically one can think of it as saying, you have these excitatory neurons that are always active and that more active they are, the easier it is to have plasticity. And so then as the GABAergic neurons develop, you get more, um, you know, turn the gain down of these excitatory neurons so they're just not as as active. And one consequence of that is that you, um, you need a certain threshold of activity to induce genes that are important for plasticity. And so we, we think that some of these plasticity genes, like the one that I love is, you know, this ARC gene, um, it becomes harder and harder to induce expression of them as the the, the cortex matures. So, um, so one idea is then if you loosen the inhibition later on in an adult brain, it, it, you can basically uh, reinduce these genes that are important for plasticity. Hmm. Yeah, that seems to make sense. Does that does that mean if I increase? Inhibition. So there's a lot of pharmaceuticals out there that does increase inhibition to the brain. Uh, one of them is alcohol. Um, <laughs> well, I, we all know what alcohol does to learning, so maybe it, yeah, it's <laughs> well, demonstrated. I think there's Jeez. some recent work about benzodiazepines um, uh, having a negative effect on plasticity. Mm. Although whether that's actually deleterious to a human, I don't know. I think they were using mice and... Um, I think it did maybe, I don't know if any of you saw this paper, but I think it did um, like decrease performance on some behavioral task that they were doing or memory or learning task. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd say yeah. generally these sort of crude um, uh, modulators of inhibition that you increase inhibition for, you know, antipsychotic means or antidepressants are not, not good for cognition um, in general. And obviously, alcohol. There's a balance. So as soon as you go over the edge, you you don't record anything. There's no you know there's no memory formation because these inhibitory neurons are so highly active that you're basically not getting any plasticity. But I wonder though, the people who take the benzodiazepines and the antipsychotics. I mean, their brains already were at a different point. Like their baseline is not the same as you know a healthy you know adult. So, you know, I think it's maybe a sure. little bit, it is, it is difficult to know um, what impact it's having on, I mean, actually it's improving their cognitive abilities, 
you know, in some ways. Although it's yeah, they, it may I mean, not be like through the mechanism you need of plasticity. The fine tuning balance, you know, right. that their, their balance is off already, and so that you have yeah. to re, re, realign, rewrite it. But in a normal person, that then you would go overshoot it. Oh, aren't we supposed to say uh, neurotypical or something like mm-hmm. that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and uh, neurodiverse. <laughs> so they do say at the end, our results provide a basis for developing strategies to reintroduce a period of enhanced plasticity in adults, you know, people who have issues, which (laughs) is very interesting. Um, Yeah. Right? Um, Yeah. Uh, Perhaps another point to make quickly is that um, I remember hearing about a long while ago that uh, in stroke, people who have had stroke um, uh, in in the brain... uh, after the stroke, you probably you often lose part of your motor function. Um, however, there is supposedly a critical period after you've had a stroke where, if during this period you go through physical rehab, you are much better able to um, learn some of the compensatory movement that you can do, so that you can actually um, compensate and move better despite the stroke, um, uh, and that this. P- critical period might last, you know, from months to maybe a year. Um, and what's interesting is that as it's been found by Ben Barris's lab a while ago that stroke actually causes astrocytes to become activated. Um, so one wonders whether the, 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 there's also a link there. Yeah. Anyway, that's it. Very full. Cool. Oh. You like this, uh, Jason? You think it's uh, good stuff? Yeah, no, I think I think this is all starting to converge and make sense. And mm-hmm. um, the role of these astrocytes, I think the the problem with a lot of science is that you just do one pillar of the of the, yeah, the big yeah. mm-hmm. the big building, and so this is just filling in some of the the pillars. So I, you know, I think this is um, really cool work. All right. Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, everyone. All, all right, that so is Twin Twenty Nine Microbe TV for show notes. You can send us questions, comments, Twin at microbe.tv. And if you'd like, if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute your contributions are U.S. federal tax deductible. Jason, <laughs> Jason Shepard is at the University of Utah and Jason Synaptic on Twitter. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Tim. That was a great, great discussion. Tim Chung is at New York University here in New York. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Vincent. Thanks, Aaron, for discussing and le- letting me know how little time <laughs> every single week. <laughs> it's like this. Vivian Morrison is at Vanderbilt University. Thanks, Vivian. Yeah, thank you, guys. This was fun. And if you wondered where Vivian is, we couldn't get her video to work. So that's why you don't see her. Yeah, you'll see a great <laughs> headshot, maybe. <laughs> or, or just a voice like God from above. <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Neuroscience. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next month. 